Welcome to Wizards Institute, the number one community to learn smart investing and financial independence. Paola Madison is one of the 75 most powerful African Americans and one of 50 outstanding Asian Americans. She's a media mogul and a highly successful businesswoman and investor. Tonight, we'll discuss Paola's colorful background and her views on business and investing. She is truly one of the most fascinating people you'll ever meet. Uh, Paula, uh, with, with your consent, I'd like to cover three major areas. One is your background. And your background, uh, all the interviews we did, it's just, it's just so much there. So we could spend three hours just on that. But really want to get to your background, what makes you tick, uh, where you came from. Again, there's a lot there. Then I, I want to focus a bit about your, your business. You've done so much, not just in corporate, but as an entrepreneur, as an investor, uh, and then get your, your principles in life, how, how you live your life, how you do business, how you invest. And uh, we've never done this before. Time permitting, I like to talk politics a little bit. I want to hear your views about what's happening in America. You have investments in Africa. You obviously are Chinese, like me, and I really hear your views on US and China. So, so those three, mac, uh, those three uh, big buckets, uh, does that sound okay with you, Paula? Sounds great. All right, so let's get started. And again, audience, feel free to type in questions and towards the end, um, well, 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 we might go live a little bit. So, uh, Paula, um, you know, I was gonna ask you if you took the 23 and me DNA test to see how, how, how Chinese you and I are related. But maybe you can tell, just start there. I know you're, you grew up in Harlem, Jamaican background, but obviously you're Chinese. And uh, you're the only person I know that has won awards being named uh, top 70, top 50 African American business person, as well as top 50 Asian American business person. So tell us about that. Uh, tell us about your book. Tell us about a documentary. Sure. So you keep saying I'm obviously Chinese and I don't think I am. I think that okay. I, I think that I am obviously black. Uh, I could obviously be African American, but I actually have to tell people that I'm part Chinese. Sure, sure. Thing, I don't think it's it's immediately recognizable. I sometimes when I tell people that, particularly if they are um, mixed race of Asian and black ancestry, and the and the and the word the smashed together word these days is Blasian. But particularly mm -hmm. if I go to Jamaica or Trinidad and Tobago or even to Toronto. Uh, people will recognize that, oh, you're part Chinese because they, they know the various looks that that blend produces. So um, to jump to some of the easier ones, um, I had my oldest brother uh, have his DNA tested through Ancestry.com. And as you might expect that with a Chinese grandfather, we were quarter Chinese. So, so that, that's what that is. Um, my parents immigrated to the U.S. from Jamaica uh, in 1945. My mother actually, it's her father who is Hakka Chinese from Guangdong province in China. He left uh, Hong Kong in 1905 at the age of 15 boarding a ship for Kingston, Jamaica in order to seek his fortune. He was a second son, so he had more freedom to travel uh, as opposed to his older brother. Uh, when he got to Jamaica, he was, as I mentioned, 15 years old and unlike many other of the um, immigrants who would have uh, taken that same route, while he, like many of them, was male, and like all of them, they were not allowed to bring their wives, their women, their families. They, the immigration laws were not receptive to families uh, to settle in uh, various parts of the West. And so the men were welcomed, uh, but as single men. Uh, unlike most of those other men, my grandfather was too young to have a family left behind in China. Mm -hmm. He arrived when he was 15. He's 15 years old. He begins working in a, a shop, a shop, a, a grocery, a mercantile establishment, which 
colloquially in Jamaica is called a Chinese shop. Mm. So he began to work in one of those in Kingston. He met one local woman who was African Jamaican. Uh, and then he also went about 40 miles away to another town. Back then it would have been a horse and buggy trip, but 40 miles away was some distance. And he had uh, opened another smaller Chinese shop in that community. And his partner there was another African Jamaican woman. As was the custom in those days, those Chinese immigrants who were merchants uh, got emotionally, sexually, physically, romantically involved with local women. And so my grandfather actually had two shops, two women, two pregnancies simultaneously. Oh, I, I don't know that. if they knew about each other, um, but I will say that um, it wasn't that uncommon and that by the time um, the, the big separation in my family happened because when my mother was three years old, my grandfather's family sent a Chinese bride who sight unseen agreed to marry my grandfather. Um, wow. He asked the two local women um, if he could have their children to raise with his Chinese wife, soon to arrive Chinese wife. One woman said yes. The other woman said no. And not only did she say no, but she said, you'll never see this child again. That latter woman was my grandmother. That's how the separation happened between my mother and her father. And then after many, many years, almost a hundred years of a separation in 2012, using the connections that I developed inside of um, the Hakka community, uh, most of whom at that point I'd met at the Toronto Hakka conference in 2012, they gave me clues and leads and inside of six weeks of that conference, I was sitting in China meeting my mother's brother and sister. Uh, there were more, she had more siblings and, um, uh, but I met two of them. The eldest was one month younger than my mother would have been. Mm -hmm. That was my Aunt Adassa, who at that point was 92. She asked that we bring all of us home to China. So I found um, my first cousins. There was another son who was my Aunt Adassa's brother who had been left behind in Jamaica. Um, I found his children, of which there were nine. And uh, two of them accompanied us when we all returned, fulfilling my Aunt Adassa's request. Um, four months later, uh, December 2012, 22 of us, Black Chinese, went to uh, Shenzhen, to Lo Sui Hap, to meet our family. And we were welcomed by 300 of my grandfather's direct descendants. Uh, I did write a book coming out of it that was published by Harper Collins. There is a documentary that another wonderful Hakka uh, sister, um, Jeanette Kong, produced and directed the documentary. And uh, I own the rights in China to the publishing rights in China. So it's in its second publication in China. Um, the Ministry of Education has recommended it for... Um, for a uh, reading list curriculum for high school and college. And just coming up in the next week, I'll be signing a contract with one of two studios. Um, one studio in China and one studio here in the United States are going to co-produce a television series based on my book. Um, so the TV series will air in China and in the United States. Um, and that's kind of what's been going on regarding that. My background is spent many years as a journalist. I was at first a newspaper journalist and a television journalist. I, I left at daily journalism when I um, left my job as um, vice president and news director. I ran the news department for the NBC owned station in New York City. Uh, I was promoted to come out here to LA to be the president of the NBC station here. 
uh, I made a presentation to the chairman of General Electric, which was then our parent company, to step into the world of Spanish language television. Um, my charge was not only to run the television station, but to get it to uh, number one in profitability and ratings in the market. A not too difficult analysis uh, that I did had me conclude that in most major cities in the United States, the largest number of news consumers are actually Spanish speaking. So Spanish language newscasts attract the most viewers. I made a present, I put together a pitch that explained if, if, if the goal is for us to be number one in revenue and ratings, we'll have to include Spanish language. So based on that, eventually, probably without a year, 18 months later, uh, GE bought the Telemundo network. So I became the president of the NBC station here in Los Angeles, as well as Telemundo stations here. And uh, so I did that for a while. I became, um, I was gonna retire early in order to go to, China, go to China to find my family there. I was convinced to stay on, to take on the role of chief diversity officer for NBC Universal. I did that, I think, for about three years. Uh, when I left that role, I retired early at the age of 58, which was always my plan. Um, and when I did that, then I stepped into some um, other businesses that my family owned. Uh, I was the CEO of a, a basketball team that we owned, uh, WNBA team, the Los Angeles Sparks. So I was the CEO of that for, I think, three or four years. Um, there was no profit to be made. And then I said, listen, you know, it's just an expensive hobby. So I'm not in the business of being in business to not make money. So I sold the team. We consummated the deal actually while I was sitting in China, uh, hanging out with my cousins, um, but sold, sold the team to Magic Johnson. And then uh, shortly thereafter, when I came back home, I was asked to join the Los Angeles Police Commission the body that runs the LAPD. Um, so I was vice president of the LA Police Commission for three years. And uh, since then, I have just uh, been doing some investment stuff, but most, mostly I've been focused on getting this book turned into a TV series. But I am still very active and involved in media uh, we still own a, a cable network called the Africa Channel, which is based here in North Hollywood. So I do some work on behalf of that, but that's, that's pretty much what I've been doing. Oh, I forgot my daughter is starring in a Bravo network TV series. My daughter is a forensic psychiatrist. She's the medical director at a psychiatric hospital and she's on a program called Married to Medicine Los Angeles. Uh, I did not want my daughter to do reality television. She wanted to do it. I made her sign a contract paying me $1 a year to be her manager. So I've negotiated for her a podcast, a book deal. She has a book coming out next year with Harper Collins and some other stuff. I just kind of do things that amuse me. I, I, I've, I've seen that show with your daughter. You guys have a good chemistry in line. So, but uh, thank you for that. And congratulations. When the Ministry of Education in China recommends your book, I don't think the numbers are very small. So congrats on that. Uh, that, that, would, that should be a very, very good project. Um, um, just for the audience, can you talk about Hakka Chinese? I don't think, I mean, I'm Hakka, you're Hakka, but I think many of us here in the audience later on with the podcast, they, uh, uh, Timmy, can I ask you to un unvideo your handsome face so we only show Paula? Apologies. Um, uh, yeah, could you explain the Hakka Chinese angle? Sure. And maybe even talk about Jamaica and how so many people, Jamaica, famous Jamaicans, actually have similar roots as you. I mean, that's a fascinating piece of sure. um, fact that most people don't know about. Right, sure. So the Hakka, H-A-K-K-A, -K -K -A, the Hakka Chinese people are a um, cultural minority group in China. 
90 plus percent of Chinese people are Han, H-A-N, that's the genus of the, of the, of the race. And then you have uh, a percentage that might be Uyghur, might be Mongol, Mongols, they might be just a few other, but, but nothing is as predominant as the Han. Hakka people are Han people. So, okay. so they are racially, they look like all the other Chinese people in China. Um, however, this cultural minority group um, originated, they hail from North Central China, and um, they number, their estimates are anywhere from between 50, 50 to 80 million worldwide, with the overwhelming majority of them being in China, but they're throughout Asia and throughout Africa and the Americas, uh, probably the only place where you won't find Hakka, maybe, maybe Antarctica. But they are known as um, the guest people, G-U-E-S-T. Um, because they are a migratory group, they're very willing to immigrate. Um, and because of uh, their um, willingness to immigrate, uh, generally for the purpose of making money, they're usually willing to immigrate in order to accumulate land and capital, et cetera, et cetera. And I say that guest is a nice way of describing who we are culturally. I, I would say that uh, a word that's probably more apt is interlopers. Mm -hmm. um, move from one area to the other, occupying lands, very clannish. Uh, move in groups, live in groups, and uh, work the land, um, establish business practices, and frequently send for others in their families. Uh, we, we, as I said, we tend to be very clannish. Um, so these, the Hakka people, uh, the women are known as Bigfoot women, uh, physically, their feet aren't by birth any bigger than anyone else's, but they are the only women in China who never bound their feet. They never bound their feet because the women, as is part of the culture, are always working. So whether they're farming, whether they are um, practicing uh, mercantile um, uh, endeavors, or even fighting alongside men, and I'll characterize that um, in explaining why I call them interlopers, because if they move from one place to another due to whatever the conflicts are that might be going on, they're going to invade someone else's land, and someone else is not going to be happy that their land has been invaded. So the Hakka people were frequently at war with other um, local people known as Bunti, the, the, the local people who were already there. And the way that the Hakka people spread is they move into an area, build these very large round houses that can hold anywhere from 50 to 100 families. And uh, they're almost like forts, frankly. And the men um, marry the local women. So, th so that's why Hakka people are the same genus as the Han folks, but it's a cultural group. It's a cultural minority group. My village in Shenzhen, China is called Luo Sui Hap. It's a uh, new crane lake. Um, and my village is about seven acres. And it's, it, it, it is being leased by the government to be the largest Hakka cultural museum in China. So much of my village is restored, by the way. So when we're talking about shooting this television series, uh, I've already gotten permission to do some of the shooting at my village, which has largely been restored. It was completed in, it started building in the 1700s, completed building in the 1900s. And uh, this particular family, my family of laws, our Japu, our, our history book 
goes back to the year 1006 BC. So my family has a documented history in China of um, 3,000 years. The Hakka people uh, were, were employed by sugar plantation owners to replace the Africans who were emancipated in the 1800s. So almost everywhere throughout the Americas and the New World where you saw the British and the Spanish and, 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 and the French and the Dutch pull out of um, slavery, but owning plantations, sure. they sent for workers uh, from China and India. If, if that was the next cheapest labor they could attract if the labor wasn't free as slavery was. So you had significant numbers of Chinese and Indian men who went to the Caribbean, Latin America, um, Africa, uh, other parts of Asia. And so you find the Hakka people everywhere, including Hawaii, where they established a lot of the um, work on the uh, pineapple plantations and so forth. So that those are the Hakka people. So you and I are of the same culture. Yes, yes. What about Jamaica? There's a huge Jamaican Hakka Chinese that have really, like you, are very successful. A lot of names that I think the audience would recognize, right? What, what, what is it about Jamaican people, Jamaican Chinese people, and your own upbringing? I know you grew up poor uh, in Harlem, uh, I think from the documentary, which I recommend for those that have not seen the film, it's fascinating whether you're Chinese or not. It's just an amazing story. I think some of you will cry, or, uh, um, really uh, learning what Paula did to really find uh, her roots back in, in China. I think it's just an amazing, amazing documentary. But can you tell us about that and tie that back to, to maybe to how you became so successful? Sure. Well, um, uh, so, some of the, the, the practices, for example, um, so, some of the practices, the cultural practices, which have to do with um, business, investing, family. Uh, when the Chinese came from China into Jamaica, almost immediately they began figuring out how to make money aside from being plantation workers. So pool resources, acquire goods, sell the goods at a profit. And those goods would most often be um, dry goods, groceries, uh, rice, sugar, flour, beans. They would buy these in bulk and then they would sell, you know, a, a tuppence worth or, a, you know, a half a, and they'd sell it and they would sell it to the to the workers. So the, the African Jamaicans who maybe didn't have enough money to actually keep their families going, they could buy these goods from the Chinese merchants on credit. And then when they get paid, they paid off. So, so this kind of got established that way. But what we did see quite quickly, as you see in many immigrant situations where there is a group of more recent immigrants and it's you know sort of the chain immigration you bring your brother you bring your cousin you bring you know your sister and then you all uh, might work in the same business for a while you might establish your own business you might live together but you pull your money until it becomes something that is um, accessible to your family um, could be profitable to your group um, in Jamaica, what we saw was the same thing we saw in Cuba, in Peru, in Venezuela, in Honduras, where the Chinese went in, chain migration, established businesses, um, and then people, um, you know, stake you and you go start another business and then someone else starts another business, but ultimately it's all sort of interconnecting. Many, many, many of the Chinese Jamaicans were all cousins. We're, we're, we're related because somebody married somebody and somebody married somebody else and that's how it works. 
the way that you, in terms of what you're talking about is the success. Um, as is the push with, I think, throughout Chinese immigrants, wherever they go, the insistence that their children stay focused on a prize, the prize being education and wealth, right? Uh, rarely do you find Chinese immigrants directing their families, their children to public service. It's business, it's ownership, it could be medicine, it could be law, but most often it is oriented towards making money. The Hakka people, as you know, are affectionately known in, as the Jews of China, not in a disparaging way, but in that same kind of, you, you are a smallish minority, persecuted in some respects, clannish, stay together, pull your resources mm -hmm. and, and propagate the wealth in such a way that many, many people can benefit from it. But it is that push that in Jamaica resulted in, for example, I was, I, I'm an alumna of Vassar College and I noted for years the recruitment that went on in Jamaica, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, et cetera, they actually go to the Caribbean islands to recruit. Mm. They go to the Caribbean islands and recruit students who most often are going to be of African descent. A lot of us who are in Ivy League and Seven Sister Colleges are not only of African descent, but we're of Asian descent. We're African and Indian, we're African and Chinese. A lot of people don't recognize us by our look, but we recognize each other. All of that to say that when I was an undergrad, it's sort of back of the envelope, quick, quick look at, oh, so we're getting more black students in the school. I was surprised that percentage wise, somewhere in the range by estimation, 20, 25% of all the black students who I had encountered, Ivy League Seven Sisters were actually from the Caribbean mm. or of Caribbean descent. And probably, 75% of those were mixed Chinese, mixed Indian sure. and African. Sure. So when you say, you know, explain the, the success and the wealth, our grandfathers, great grandfathers were merchants. Our gra grandfathers, great grandfathers were those same men who like my grandfather started, started a shop, right? So they sent their children to overwhelmingly Catholic schools, not because of the religion necessarily, but because it was an upwardly mobile, you know, if you, they're not becoming Baptists, they're not becoming Methodists in the Caribbean, depending upon what island or country you're in, upward, upward mobility is Catholic church. So they send their children to the Catholic schools and the recruiters from the top schools in the United States are going to those schools to recruit. So what sure. you're having is an identification of a pool of people who's, who's one generation, two generations back, their ancestors were immigrants from Asia. Those parents had enough money to pay to send their children to the best schools. Then they get into the best schools in the United States. Then they get to the United States and rise to the ranks in corporate America. Even um, I know some who were in um, President Obama's White House. Many of those African Americans who you saw with pretty significant jobs actually are Caribbean. Um, um, Eric Holder, I think his, par his parents may have been from, I think they were from Barbados. Uh, but you can look at him and see he's got, he's mixed with Indian. Um, mm. And then right now, you know, in that group of women whose names are being considered for vice presidential candidates, both Susan Rice and my friend Kamala Harris, who I've been backing for years, they're Jamaican. So, oh, so I didn't know that. Okay. Oh, yeah. So yeah. what you're well, Kamala is Jamaican. Her father is Jamaican. Her mother is actually from India. And Susan Rice's father is Jamaican. I believe it's her mother who's African American. But, um, I said all that to say that 
there is a drive, a push. You know, you said I grew up poor. I did because my parents never got along. My, 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 my father was not poor. My mother, because she would not stay with him, was poor and, and kept us, but he wanted us to live with him. What ultimately happened is the values that they had, absolutely the same. My brother went to Williams College, MBA from Harvard. I'd, there was no question. Somebody congratulated my father when my brother was graduating from Harvard. And my brother said he, was, he wasn't going to go to graduation. He's like, no, I, I'm not going to get a degree. I already got a degree, uh, meaning the ceremony. And my father, my father said, well, but you should go. And my father's friend said, oh, you must be so proud. And my father said, proud? Well, I came to this country for my children to go to Harvard. Like, what are you talking about? So all of this kind of expectation um, that's placed upon you, there, there was no expectation, oh, go have a good time and, you know, jump rope or play basketball. I don't, you know, the mm -hmm. parents are saying, I don't, I don't care if you do that, but you don't have time to do that. You have to get A's. You have to do Excel. That's how it comes to be that I think there's an overrepresentation, one. And two, I think that there is a drive towards success because that's all we've ever, you know, been told. In my family, when we sit around with the, with, if we're generation one, we sit around with generation two and three, and now there's a generation four, but generation two and three are old enough and lucid. We sit around talking about investing and how to make money. I guess other, I don't know what other families talk about, but we talk about money and how to make money and how to invest money and what you should do with your money and what's a wise way to yeah. handle money. It's, it's, you know, in, the, in between <laughs> telling jokes and swimming and fishing and whatever, we talk about money and investments. That, that's, um, I, I, uh, I can relate to a lot of what you're saying, um, Paula. Um, so the title of our book, again, is called The Ten Commandments of Investing. And the analogy, obviously, is the Bible's Ten Commandments, which are essentially guiding principles how to live life as a good Christian, as, as I'm sure you know. Um, what we discover after studying a lot of successful investors and business people are that essentially these 10, 10 commandments are guiding principles. Can you put all this together? You know, it doesn't have to be the Chinese angle. It could be growing up in Harlem. It could be obviously being a, 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 a black American uh, in, in, in America. What are your principles or, or what's your guiding light overall, Paul, that you would say made you so successful and you know what are you teaching your kids what are these 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 values or principles sure well uh i, I suppose the very first one would start with me meaning that um whenever i learned about promotions right mm -hmm. about how to get ahead i would research you know i started out my career as a journalist so I'm, a, I'm an, an historian, a journalist, so I try to gather as much information in order to help me reach conclusions. And what I, what I concluded early on was, it will be to my benefit to learn what are the next positions that have as part of the um, package of benefits the things that will benefit me in a big way. So I began to target, for example, um, our uh, RSUs, stock options, deferred income, uh, car allowance. These are all the things that I, I, I realized, you mean people are getting those? As, as in, so they're not just getting salary, they're getting those other things, yes. Then every time, as I was guiding my career, whatever the next thing was that I should consider as an option, well, there's a title, of course, and there are responsibilities, of course, but what's the other stuff, mm. right? What's, what's the other stuff? And when it came to a point where I realized 
it's a very elite group. Um, and it's a club. So what's behind the door to the club? What do the club members get that I should target? So I would make decisions about the next thing to do based on what was being offered. And I came up with this really crazy formula when I was 22 years old and I was a reporter in upstate New York, a newspaper reporter, many years ago. And the salary was, I'll say something like $22,000 a year. And I thought, okay, I'm 22 and my salary is 22,000. So if I'm 23, my salary is probably going to be 23,000, but it can't keep going that way. I got to figure out how to change, you know, that algorithm. I got to figure out how to change that. So I made up my mind that by the time I was 27 years old, I was going to earn close to twice my salary. I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I figured out that's what has to happen because otherwise I'm going to be stuck down here with these people, whoever these people are who are going to work every day. And I wasn't sure that that's who I wanted to, that I, I knew I needed to go to work every day, but I didn't want to be whatever down here was. So ultimately I drove it to where by the time I was 30, I was making, I think, $60,000 a year as a reporter. But when I reached the age of 32 and got a big promotion, my salary was something like $85,000 a year. And then I was like, okay, level set at a different level. Now what I have to do is figure out what the six-figure salaries are to get into. And I'm talking about, this was probably 1984, 85, something like that. I always made friends, relationship, acquaintance with somebody in human resources. I always wanted to pick human resources brain to get a sense of, so where do I rank among my peers in terms of compensation? And I vowed to myself that I, if I was never among the top three, I would leave. So that's been a thing in the back of my head from way, way back. And the other thing that I always focused on was I have this kind of practice where I think somewhere around the age of 27, 28, I said, you know, I think this annual review thing is stupid the way it's done. Because I'm sitting here and this person has tried to figure out and remember what I did for the past 12 months and then you know, in order to play this game correctly, you got to give me some pluses, but you also got to give me some minuses. And I was the, you don't have to give me any minuses, right? So I would at least once a quarter breeze by my immediate supervisor and ask, hey, you know, you have five minutes? Sure, what's up? I was just wondering, can you tell me how you think I'm doing? That's kind of, that can be off-putting, like, oh, wait, like, is this a scary conversation? But how, you know, how am I doing? So I always made a point of receiving that information well. That was tactfully how I would handle it. And I'd always ask for development suggestions. The next quarter I'd go back and give a report back on, so you know, da, 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 and you suggested that I do blah, 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 and I did. And then, so, so, you know, so how do you think I'm doing? I did that until my annual review when the time came for my annual review, we never talked about the past 12 months. My annual review, review was spent on, so what do you think my future looks like? Gotcha. Uh, and it does a few things. Um, I know that most managers fire people on Thursdays or Fridays when they have to fire someone. Not because there's any commandment about that, but because it's such an unpleasant um, thing to have to do that psychologically the managers put it off and put it off and put it off until, oh God, weekend's almost here. 
I got to do it now, but then at least I won't see so-and-so over the weekend. I won't see that, you know, it won't be all miserable. So I always made a point if I was going to terminate somebody, I would do it on a Monday or Tuesday because I refuse to succumb to that. But most importantly, I will say to you that um, for me, I try to figure out how does this whole thing work and to make sure that my bosses were never having trepidation about coming to talk to me about anything because I already conditioned them quarterly. We're going to chat about stuff and you can tell me the things that I messed up and I'll work on it hard and I'll fix it and blah, blah, blah. So I found that for me, in terms of my own career, people would put me up for jobs that I hadn't even considered. I would, I would be um, recommended to be on, you know, on task forces. I, I, I developed a reputation as a fix it person. Give, give it to Paula, she'll fix it. And, and in my news life, um, I, I was not the number one person. I wasn't the, the, the boss in the news department. I wasn't even the assistant boss in the news department, but I had a strategy where I never lived more than a 10, 15 minute arrival time to work. Because when the plane crashed, when the building collapsed, when the something happened, I was always the first person in the news department. I would get there even before the boss. And on my way there, I might give the boss a call and say, hey, I'm on my way there. Is there anything you want me to do? And before everybody else got in, I'd have all the coverage set up. I'd have photographers here. I'd have reporters there. I had everything set up so that what I became known for was if there's a disaster, give it to her. And that's how I leapfrogged over people in my career. And got to, so, so it really is, I think, a matter of strategy. It's, it's a matter of thinking it through. Um, and then when the time came, the other part, which was very Jamaican, you know, the thing that Jamaicans are stereotypically known for, which is having a million jobs. Having a million jobs is merely multiple income streams. So my father always said to me, whatever you do, do not do not stay and get a gold watch for retirement. And I was like, okay. He said, why would you stay somewhere and make that man rich? My mother would say the same thing. She didn't even understand all that, but she knew enough to know if you don't own it, then why are you still there? So I learned at an early age, yes, take a corporate job, yes, get as much compensation as you can, live below your means, take that money and invest it. So by the time we were 20, I was 20, 21, 22 years old, my brothers and I, we owned brownstones in Harlem. We, we, we had you know, real estate investments and we parlayed that into other things and other things and other things. But it, it, it has always been you know, the thinking about how to make money. So, so this, thank you for that, Paula. So um, getting a lot, so, so some of the secrets is to Paula's success, uh, you, you, as you mentioned, is uh, education, right? Big, big focus on education, whether that's Chinese or, or American it's education. You very early on demonstrated a vision or a conviction of what you want, even if you don't have it. You knew what you wanted and you went for it. It sounds to me like you really know how to manage people including especially your superiors, which is something that's quite, quite, quite interesting to hear. Um, and uh, entrepreneurship, right? Uh, so, so thank you for that. Um, uh, this is an investment talk. So uh, I, I think you've got a very unique situation. You, you obviously are, are very familiar with the states the multiple asset classes, multiple businesses. You also go to China, you understand China and the culture there. And obviously you've done investments in Africa uh, with Africa Channel. Uh, for your wealth, for your family's wealth, um, where where are you invested? So right now, maybe in general terms, how do you allocate your money given yeah. how crazy the the world is today? Yeah. So given how crazy the world is today, let me say this to you: that of the three of us, I'm the youngest, and I'm the only girl. 
And, and the, the bulk of our capital came because my oldest brother, mm. um, he created an algorithmic trading company back in, I think like, like the mid to early 80s. And because he got in so early, we were able to, you know, my husband and I, we invested in his business. Um, I'm sorry, he started, the, he started the company in the late 80s. But my husband and I invested early enough so that uh, I think after the company was maybe two or three years old, it was capitalized at $500 million. And Wow. This is a quant, quant trading shop? Mm -hmm. This is a quantitative trading shop, a hedge fund for uh, technology, this sort of an was, AI, this like a was, renaissance? This was uh, algorithmic. He, he built, he actually built the computers. He put the computers together and wrote the software teaching <laughs> how to trade, right? So this was in the day when I believe the, the Chicago Merck, you couldn't have any more than 15% of the trades that could be done this way. And the yep. New York Stock Exchange had it at maybe 8%. My brother got in very early because he created some of this stuff. And in no time, so Sequoia, Francisco Brothers, they invested in, in the company and suddenly we had a whole lot of money. Wow, what's the name of the shop? Well, it's Williams Group Holdings. Uh, it isn't what it was then because we right. brought in more people yeah. and my brother uh, became like the chairman emeritus and whatever. But in terms of, uh, I will tell you that I, I am the one in my family who most often try to hang on to and put aside for whatever that rainy day might be. Mm. So I vowed to my husband, I'm just shy of 68. I, vow I vowed to my husband when I was, I think, 60 years old that I would do no more really interesting investing that the only things that I would invest in were the, the projects that I was coming up with. So like right, now, yeah. right, right now I'm trying to figure out because if, if this deal that I'm doing will allow a streaming service access to China for the first time ever. Now it's gonna be connected to my project, but I'm trying to figure out, so how I get compensated for having put this deal together, right? When, you know, okay. Okay. right when all the streaming services so. out there can't get um, distribution in China because the government says you have to have Chinese auspices in order to even think about doing that. Well, this is what's going to happen on this project. And my, my, my attorney, who's a really brilliant guy, he's an entertainment attorney, and that's where we're holding him. I'm like, yeah, but so... I need to figure out how I get a percentage of something because I'm, I'm the one, and, he, and he's kind of like, that's not usually what's a part of the package. I don't care. You got to figure out how to make it a part of the package. That, I mean, my life is about busting things up. I mean, my life is about thinking, figuring out different ways of doing stuff. Let me can figure this out. So sure. that's where sure. we are. So for, so for me, uh, when I left, and retired from NBC Universal in 2011 at the age of 58, I think, yeah. Uh, I wanted to be sure that I was going to be independently wealthy for the rest of my life. And at that point, minimizing risks. So I, I have people coming at me all the time about investing and doing stuff. I actually help other people put together investment deals, but I, you know, my husband has made me promise to not. Okay. So it sounds like from an investing standpoint, you're very lucky. I don't know if you saw the today's story in Wall Street Journal about uh, traders, that most traders are just pure luck, but you've got family member, your brother, I believe, that are, is one of the few that seems to have crack that code and, and uh, really, really rare. So, so it's amazing, amazing. Well, the other thing not, I'd say about traders is that sometimes it's in their blood and they don't know when to stop. Gotcha. 
Right. And, but you, and, you're lucky because you've kin that that's very successful. So yeah. the, the cash that you have, you know, they make money for you. And then the rest of it sounds to me like you're just a perpetual entrepreneur. I'm a perpetual entrepreneur. Doing this. That's fantastic. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you for that, Paul. Um, again, I, it, uh, we haven't covered this before, but given your background, I know that you were advising Kamala Harris when, when she was uh, vying for the candidacy uh, and you're close to her. Um, maybe you just... I'd love to hear just you share your views on um, the politics side. What, you know, what's your views about any burning message as far as whether it's race relations, what Trump's doing with China, uh, your, your views on the election, uh, whatever you, I know you've got convictions on a lot of those, but I'd love to hear any and all of those. <laughs> well, <laughs> Well, uh, it's going to be a bit rambling, but I'll, I'll start with, I think that uh, what we saw here in the United States was during the South Carolina primary, right? When, once the primary, the Democratic primaries started to happen throughout the South, um, um, Congressman Jim Clyburn, who is the uh, House Majority Whip, right? He, um, he's the kingmaker. Mm. It is he who said to the assemblage, it's Joe Biden. And when he said that, that rippled throughout the Black South. Um, what the African-American electorate here for the most part realizes is that we cannot have another four years of Donald Trump. And even if Joe Biden isn't 100% of everything that we want, he's somebody who we can work with, right? So Jim Clyburn does that. And what we all know is that there is now a list of things that the black community in the United States expects Joe Biden upon achieving the White House to fulfill. We came through for you. Had Jim Clyburn not stood up in South Carolina, if everybody thinks back to then, Biden was finished. It was that seminal moment when the tide turned, right? So now what we're staring at is uh, who's gonna be the running mate? Who's gonna be the running mate? And he made the statement that his running mate would be a woman. He also said he was gonna appoint a black woman to the Supreme Court. I think he said it was a black woman, not just a woman. Um, so I think that this is an opportunity for a nation that has been ripped apart due to tribalism. This will be an opportunity for this nation to come together around some sanity as well as understanding that everybody has to come in under this tent. But this tribalism we've seen in, it's going on throughout Europe, England, Germany, Italy, France, where the demographics of the world, of the Western world are such that people of color are either not in the minority or soon to be not in the minority. And it is that fear of life is not going to be what we know it, that had people who already knew that as a candidate, Donald Trump was scurrilous, but at least he's of our tribe. Hmm. That's what I believe has happened. And that's why he has been 
so in these days focused on racial divide because there is a portion of the electorate who he is scaring into they're going to take away your neighborhood they're going to take away your rights they're going who's they build a wall who are you keeping out no chain migration your wife came here and her in-law her parents came as chain migration it's 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 the we're here now close the door pull up the ladder nobody else can get in that same statement the same guy who called some nations shit nations those same nations now won't let united states citizens in because of what he has done to mishandle this nation's health right oh. Now about China, oh my God, that is merely create an enemy, create an enemy, create an enemy as a distraction. And the way he rattles off the numbers of dead and sick and whatever, he doesn't seem to care about these as real honest to God people who matter to someone else. So the, the, as, as you know, the running tally that's being kept by some Asian American organizations about the instances of racial discrimination, beating, harassment, spitting upon, because he's calling it the Kung flu or because he's calling it the Wuhan flu or the Chinese. It, it, it is a way to further divide mm. the population and the electorate, but he's making a mistake. Paul, it, it doesn't look like COVID and economy will be under control between now and the election. We don't have that much time, right? It's like 100 days, or less than 100 days. And um, I keep hearing that Mr. Trump, you know, he'll do anything to, to win. Uh, and as you said, you need an enemy, you need a distraction, right? And China is really, really convenient. How, how far do you think this will go? What, what, what he not, the more desperate this becomes from an election standpoint, do you think he'll um, really push the aggressiveness with China that might lead to even a war or a serious conflict? What's your sense of that? I think it could lead to a standoff. Hmm. I think China <clears throat> is probably waiting and watching for this election too. I, I don't want to be seduced by the polls. And I don't think China wants to be seduced by the polls. But what we saw after the murder of George Floyd, and we saw, <clears throat> excuse me, Gen Z and others in the streets lock, linked arm in arm, regardless of race, gender they were there um that said to the rest of the world that he had lost control he's lost control he's not standing on solid ground so i don't think china wants to be what's the word um egged on mm. into a conflict that in a few months might not even be a conflict right so china has taken advantage of all that's going on of course i mean take a look at hong kong take a i mean it, 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 these distractions have served china well in, in many ways it's been counterproductive for the u.s many many ways it, it's actually very really dumb from a chinese perspective because he, trump is actually helping china get stronger right he many, 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 many. get stronger but but I bet he believed that he would be, and he himself would be in a much stronger position so that he could lead some kind of an onslaught against China. Remember, when all this started happening with Hong Kong, United States was looking around at, at Europe, England, 
France, where, where are you guys? Are you not guys not going to, and they were all like, hey, dude, we're not in it. We'll issue some sanctions. We'll say, we'll send out letters saying that we don't think this is a good idea. But those folks were not going to line up behind the erratic president of the United States. He has so diminished the office of the president of the United States that they're, I think they're all kind of going, okay, let's just wait until November because, you know, and then as he starts saying the, the foolishness of, well, you know, I might not leave because it might not be a legitimate election. It's like, dude, don't, don't, don't have anybody go in there and, and evict you from, don't, don't do that. But it's going to take a while to undo the damage that he's done but I don't think a while is going to be a decade. I think it's going to be not easy, mm. but it'll be likened to, you know, when you had the crazy uncle who came to Thanksgiving dinner and threw the turkey on the floor and everybody went, oh, that's a one time only, we'll never invite him back again. It's that kind of thing, right? But the, but, the, but the real danger is the numbers of people who he has appointed to federal courts who, you know, will be there for a lifetime. You know, but then I had hope because John Roberts, you know, who we all thought was going to solely come down on the side of whatever the, whatever 45 wanted, he's already demonstrated that, yeah, no, it's not going to work like that. So, you know, the, 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 the basis, the foundation for this, the, this nation is revolution. Um, I said to some news directors, all of whom were not born in the United States, as they were working on coverage of um, the hashtag Black Lives Matter protests. And the way that the coverage, their coverage was going was like, you know, these lawless people. Now, granted, the looters absolutely were lawless, but the people marching in the streets, and I, and I asked them, um, just, you know, how many of you were actually born in the United States? And none of them were, because the, the skill, the fluency in Spanish language frequently means that Spanish television will bring people in from countries where that's their native tongue. They may become US citizens, but they, Spanish is their first language. And I said to them, so you may not really be aware of the meaning of the First Amendment. If I were you, I said I would post it in huge letters in every newsroom that I have. I said, because there was something in this country that happened around tea, which was a very popular drink. And the cry went out, no taxation without representation. And they threw bales of tea into Boston Harbor. The act that began the war for independence. And I said, you know who the first patriot was who died in the war of independence? They said, no, I said, his name was Crispus Attucks. He was a black man. I said, this nation is built on civil disobedience. So once you understand that, what you then understand is that it, it taps into a vein in this country of the citizens that say, no, we don't want people looting, but that's a different bunch, go get them. But the people who are marching peacefully in the streets, that's their right. I support their right to do that, right? And yet, when we saw them clear the streets in front of the White House so he could walk a few blocks for a photo op, even people who were at that point supporters of his were chilled. You can't do that. Did he just do that? So 
it comes back to, I think, Russia, don't get me started on Russia, but I think China, I think Xi Jinping will, will wisely let, let's wait. Because in the meantime, Trump has given China cover to do Hong Kong, the Hong Kong that we knew a year ago, never, it's never coming back. It's never coming back. Um, th th this may be a controversial question. Um, America is one of the most diverse nations in the world. Um, it's also racially most charged. It's always, it's always been, right? The, the Chinese Exclusion Act, obviously slavery history, there's just so much of that disparity and inequality. But yet America has always been great, despite being a noisy democracy and despite these racial issues. Um, um, I'm sorry, tell me what you mean by America has always been great. You mean in terms of- a great of nation, economy and whatnot, despite these issues, which obviously during the Trump presidency has been um, aggravated, right? Um, so in one sense, I'm thinking, once this subsides, or even if it doesn't subside, it will pick itself up again longer term and still, still be a great country going forward. I, 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 I want to believe that as, as an American. Um, then you've got places like China, which is really just homogeneous, right? It's just a bunch of Han people running around, hawker otherwise, uh, that are working in tandem. Uh, and I think that will also be great. I think the difference is America tends to think it's great and it goes out there and thinks they're the only system that works, right? Whereas there should be multiple systems. The Chinese system has goods and bads, but it will work. And they don't go around telling everybody off as America does in starting war. So, so it's, it'll be quite interesting to see how this evolves over the next 20 years. Um, my bet is America will be still standing uh, post-Trump. And my bet is you have a much stronger China that hopefully I believe is not aggressive or combative uh, and, and we can coexist. Right. Um, I'm not had, sure if you agree with that, but yeah, yeah. Well, I had, a, I had a really interesting conversation with my young cousin who lives in Shenzhen. Uh, he speaks about four languages, um, went to undergraduate and graduate school in New Zealand, right? And he said, Paula, so, so, so he's referred, let's say that it's April. He said, Paula, I don't understand. I'm looking at all the news reports about uh, COVID-19 and the numbers in the United States are going up. But I keep seeing pictures of like people on the beach and they're outside and they're not wearing masks. He said, I don't understand. And I said, so Henry, here's how a democracy works. Um, I said, where you're from, the government says, if you have a fever, you cannot come outside. The government says, you must wear a mask. All the people say, okay. Mm -hmm. The citizens, okay. And if they see another citizen not doing it, those citizens will chastise that one who is not complying and everybody in lockstep, okay. I said, here, the government says, we recommend you wear masks and people say, give me liberty or give me death. He said, what do you mean? I said, that's a democracy. Noisy, but effective longer term. Longer well, term. but it's, 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 I do think that we will come back. I do. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't, I, I will admit to you, I do not understand this willingness to send children to school while this is still doing what it's doing. I don't understand that because to me, nothing is more precious nor valuable than a child, than my child. And I've been, I've, I've read that, you know, in Jamaican Patois, it says I'd rather have a live dumb child than a smart dead one, 
which had to do with sending them back to school while sure. this is raging, right? So there were some things that just confound me. I really don't understand some of this, but I have been quarantined since late January when my cousins told me what it was doing in China and that they can't get any masks. So I went on Amazon and ordered 800 uh, uh, N94 masks. I got 400 of them before there weren't any more. My brother was going back to China, but they closed the border so he couldn't take them. So I was sitting here with 400 masks, which I distributed <laughs> to my family. And then when all things blew over in China, my family, we were in the spirit of entrepreneurship, supplying hospitals, doctors, offices, friends with masks that my cousins were shipping to me from China. PPEs, I had PPEs that I was, I was in the PPE business for a while. Great, great. Uh, consummate entrepreneur. Uh, Paula, um, my time is up. You've been really generous with your advice and, and uh, your time. Uh, just two quick questions. Um, I see my nephew and my daughter's on, but for, for the folks here uh, and for the book, what would be your parting advice for a, an investor or a business person? Any, any uh, parting words of wisdom to you uh, that leads to success? Sure. Uh, well, there's always the, in terms of how you're starting out. And in the starting out, I'm a big believer in the West African and therefore Jamaican process of a, of a susu. And that's the one where uh, maybe a dozen people come together and monthly they each put in the same amount. It's called a hand. And then consecutively, each person collects the entire pot. So it isn't that you're making money, it's an enforced savings plan. It's Got so it. successful and so popular that 25 years ago when I was in New York, if you belonged to a SUSU, Citibank, Chase Manhattan, all those banks counted that as among your assets, right? In, in China, it's, 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 it's a variation of a fui, but it's the same kind of thing when you don't have access to capital then what you do is turn to people who, who value your, you as, and trust you and invest in you because you are a trusted, honorable person, right? Um, so I tell young people that all the time. I have some friends of mine who are women in corporate America who 15 years ago when they were starting out and they weren't sure how, what to do with their money, they now own property all over the place because there are six of them who formed a SUSU. They own condos in Florida, a beautiful home on Martha's Vineyard, and they, they, this is what they've done with their money. Um, I would suggest that unless you find some sort of an angel investor, but if you're young, if you don't have parents who have deep pockets and you're starting out, figure out how to assemble a small group of people who are beyond reproach and are very trustworthy and will not drop out. Because when you get to the point where somebody is putting in $5,000 a month and someone is collecting that pot, that can be very helpful to how you can start mm -hmm. and buy and own and invest. But, but, but I know people who are in two or three of these and uh, have used them to change their family's financial standing. Develop a, a SUSU network that backs you. Uh, SUSU, as you know, is uncle in Chinese, right? So I'm not sure if there's a link there, but uncles do lend money in China. And uh, it's funny, we have a couple of audience members here, Clive in Atlanta and Tra, we're part of this uh, real estate group. I guess we're, we're creating a SUSU as a concept to, to co-invest in, uh, in real estate. So I, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, Paula, um, please tell us how the audience, if they haven't yet, can find your documentary, um, Finding Sam Lowell. Uh, get a hold of your book as well as uh, potentially contact you. Sure. So all of that information and more is on my website, which is finding Samuel Lowe, L O W E, 
FindingSamuelLow.com. But the and the book and the documentary are called Finding Samuel Low. They can be found on iTunes, Amazon, uh, um, any platform that is distributing documentaries. You'll find that, uh, and all booksellers, all digital, uh, and the, there's even an, an audio version which I narrated. Um, so they are uh, Kindle. It's everywhere. Easy to find. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think I want to really recommend the the, the book. Uh, again, I haven't read the book, but the, the the documentary again, especially in these times of racial craziness all over the world. Mm -hmm. When you watch uh, Paula and her, I don't know, your entourage of family, how many members, um, Black Americans flying to China on a plane load and just hugging strangers that are Chinese, uh, and I think through your efforts, you also help Kyle Anderson, uh, the NBA player. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I met his mom at one of his the events mom. in New York, and I, I also saw that YouTube where Kyle Anderson, who plays for Memphis, is it? Now I forget. So, yeah, mm -hmm. and his family went back to China, and his whole entourage of Black Americans are hugging all these Chinese people. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if, if Black Americans out of nowhere can go to China and, and get to get together and, and get along with uh, with uh, Chinese in the villages, there's got to be a, a better way, <laughs> right, Paul? Well, so there's, a show in China. there's a show in China called, uh, I think it's called uh, You Talk to the World. I can't, I can't remember the, the translation, but uh, 30 million Chinese, uh, I was on that show, uh, me and my first cousin, one of my first cousins, and we were explaining and telling our family story. And they said that the response was huge and overwhelming because it explains, and I, and I said, if you see people looking like me in China, it doesn't always mean that we're tourists. Sometimes we're actually coming home to family. Yeah. That's fantastic, fantastic. All right, Paula, thank you so much uh, again. Uh, one of the most fascinating talks we've had. Uh, we will get this out on uh, all of our podcasts and YouTube and uh, also post your contact information in the uh, in those settings. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate Sam. it. All right. all right. Okay. Thank you for joining us. Please visit Wizards Institute to access the blog summary of today's session, to learn more about other speakers and to network with other investment wizards. Wizards Institute, the number one community to learn smart investing and financial freedom.